I'm Dr. Mary Clifton, your host, and tonight we're joined by a very special guest, Dr. Eric Paulson. He's a laboratory specialized doctor, and I'm going to let him tell you a little bit more about himself. We're going to spend tonight talking about D8 and other hemp-derived concentrates, otherwise known as synthetics uh, in, in some circles, and I'm sure there's a couple of other synonyms we'll share with the crowd tonight, Eric. But um, but uh, we're here to talk about D8 and, and its impact on the uh, regulated cannabis industry. So thank you again, Eric, for agreeing to be on the podcast with us. Well, thank you for having me, Dr. Clifton. I'm really excited about this podcast and looking forward to talking to you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, Dr. Paulson, and also uh, you know, how you got into the industry? It's, it's always such an interesting story, the person's individual path to uh to coming to the industry and then uh and then what your particular role is sure yeah so um i i guess my path starts uh i, I was a high school uh teacher before the high school chemistry teacher before um before even doing any anything like this um but uh you know i i, I kind of missed doing the science I, I enjoyed you know teaching people and talking to people about chemistry but but I missed actually doing chemistry and, and being a part of it. So, so I went to grad school and got my PhD. And while I was there, actually, I met uh, Dave and Josh, the, the two co-founders of uh, our lab, Infinite Chemical Analysis Labs. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, even then they were, they were already starting to talk about, uh, you know, starting up this lab. And, you know, we really wanted, or they really wanted to focus on, um, you know, authenticity and, um, you know, accuracy and transparency and, you know, basically all the things you would want, I, I would think from a testing lab. Um, and, you know, with, with kind of the, the chemistry and the ana specifically analytical chemistry uh, background um, to kind of, or an expertise to kind of get th things going. So, I mean, I really, you know, became uh, enamored with that whole uh, drive of theirs and, and so once I once I uh, got my PhD, I just decided to join on, and um, and so now, yeah, I I I work with uh, a, a couple of different analyses. Uh, you know, I look at uh, terpene content and and uh, residual solvent content, but uh, also uh, cannabinoid content. So I have a lot of experience in different, a couple of different areas. And you guys have been seeing a rise in testing for D8 samples, I'm sure. I mean, I've been sending some samples in for product development and hearing that they're backed up. You know, they just can't do an overnight anymore. They're three to five days or five to seven days out because of all of the D8 products that are flooding their, the testing centers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we definitely see a lot of D8 samples and a lot of other, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I, I would definitely say in the last six months, an increase in general uh, in the variety of, of you know, can cannabinoids and cannabinoid-like like compounds. Um, so yeah, so definitely, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of made it an interesting and, and more, I, I would say, exciting, uh, you know, area to kind of be focused on and looking at. Yeah, yeah, it definitely uh, is disruptive for sure to be having uh, uh, to to be having these products in place. What what do you see as the position of these hemp concentrates uh, in the regulated cannabis industry? So I you know I think I think well you know just just to kind of define everything out um, so that you know the, you know the people aren't yeah confused I think we or, should start they're, with they're some different good definitions different yeah so. exactly different terminologies and things like that so so what we we call so first of all here in California especially we call cannabis the 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 you know I guess strain of the plant that you know contains high amounts of THC generally over the 0.3 percent. Uh, THC that that kind of is the cutoff, and then we call hemp uh, the you know anything below 0.3 percent delta 9 THC, right? So mm -hmm. so that's our our kind of uh, delineation there. I know for cannabis, some people call the whole thing cannabis, and you know, there's marijuana, and there's there's just different terminologies for that. So so that's how we delineate that. Um, and of course, we have uh, different regulatory spheres for that, which, you know, I'll kind of get into a little bit more. Um, so we think about but, cannabis as sort of the plant and things that are derived, uh, 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 directly from the plant without any kind of, uh, chemical, uh, um, uh, exchange going on. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. So, 
So I, I would say that that um, now what we're seeing is there's a further delineation, or the, I guess you could say a muddying of the of the lines, you know, because mm -hmm. we have uh, we have you know kind of naturally extracted cannabinoids from both cannabis and hemp, and we have uh, cannabinoids that have been extracted mostly from hemp that mm -hmm. will be you know, and and I, I would say particularly CBD that are then uh, converted through some chemical process into other cannabinoids, either ones that do naturally exist in some strain of, of, of the cannabis or hemp or uh, these kind of new compounds or, or, or ones that maybe had, you know, had been extracted at one point, but are such a small concentration that they're really not there in, in any appreciable amount, right? Yeah. Um, so there, now, so there's- where, where along this pathway would you put CBD? You know, is is CBD considered a hemp-derived concentrate? Yeah, so I would Your say hemp. I would say CBD would be considered a naturally derived concentrate from hemp. Uh, that's what I would say. And and you know, naturally the, derived. Yeah, and to me, the the distinction really comes about in, in terms of you know what kind of processes are you using and what kind of uh, you know chemicals are you using to to do these you know extractions and conversions and things. So. You know, typically with most cannabinoids, a lot of extractions are performed using, you know, relatively benign solvents like you know, ethanol and um, pentane and butane and, and even carbon dioxide and liquid nitrogen. And, you know, obviously in large, large quantities, you don't want to be consuming these things, but um, or inhaling, you know, butane or ethanol. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but um, but they're relatively benign, you know, action levels that we have for you know legal the legal cannabis market are pretty high for all of those things. Um, and you think in most cases in the processing and distillation that you know the residues from those are generally if you will burned off or evaporated away. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know we we do in, in for all you know legal cannabis products in the compliance phase we are mm -hmm. required to test for all of those um, you know kind of common solvents and so um, you know, generally, if they are there, they're at very low, you know, quantities well below the action limits, or they're just completely absent. Okay. Um, now with the, the converted cannabinoid kind of uh, sector, I would say, um, <coughs> excuse me, there are generally more, um, there's a larger variety of things that are being used um, in terms of solvent. So, th so this, is, this would generally occur after an extraction uh, and let's say you'll get a CBD isolate or a CBD distillate. You'll take that uh, and then uh, redissolve it in some other kind of solvent. Typically, those ones that are used are uh, methylene chloride. Um, I've seen toluene. <coughs> Excuse me, that third's kind of dry. Sometimes um, you can use like a hydrochloric uh, acid. Right, right, and so all that also, and and those things will also be added additionally. So hydrochloric acid, you'll see um, peritoneum sulfonic acid. Um, sometimes you'll see metals like palladium or platinum being used, or uh, Lewis acid. So, so there's there's a number of different compounds you can use uh, to to add to these um, these you know this CBD okay. mixture. So you get a hemp derived concentrate from whatever way that you did that by using typically ethanol or pentane or butane or just the CO2, the, uh, uh, and then, and then from that con that concentrate is then dissolved into one of these, uh, one of these acids or, uh, the methyl chloride or toluene. Mm -hmm. And then that induces the chemical reactions. Cause I mean, if we think about uh, D9, right. And you, and you, I mean, everybody, I was going to actually wear my, my little necklace so that we could use it because you know everybody has a piece of jewelry like that or a t-shirt where it has the the the, the um molecule across here I, at least i do and i wear mine all the time and my kids tease me that that is not mm. cool <laughs> just mm. is not is not fashionable either but i love I mean, it <laughs> you know like, beauty is not i the holder right so yeah i'll tell you when i wear one to a conference everybody loves it but it's it's got basically that big circle right with that trail of car 
hydrocarbons going off to the side, there's a few hydroxylations, but it's a big circle with that trail. And what mm -hmm. we're doing, especially particularly in D8, is that that circle has a double bond here and you're flipping the double bond, right, mm -hmm. between a different set of carbons. And it's really an identical molecule except for that flip, but you require this bathing, this uh, dissolving of the CBD into one of these uh, solvents or acids in order to make that uh, double bond flip. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then, right. and then with CBD, yeah, there, there's usually a couple steps involved, but um, yeah, the, generally the conversion processes are pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, yeah. So I, I, you know, th there are, there are some other issues that are involved. Um, so I think, <clears throat> you know, one thing that um, we're most interested in is, well, I, I guess you say two things um, are those compounds that are being produced um, safe, you know, that's, that's one question, but then are uh, these kind of side products safe that are also being produced and the, um, the additional, you know, uh, solvents and, and acids, are they still present in the material after, uh, conversion, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, because you do worry about uh, contamination. I mean, I have read that D8 is highly concentrated in hashish, especially in, you know, properly cultivated and aged hashish that's been aged longer than six months can mm -hmm. be 60% D8. Is that, uh, mm. I mean, I don't, I don't know anybody who's creating hashish in an old fashioned way like that and allowing it to age, but have you heard that? Uh, I have not actually. Um, so that's, that's interesting. So that that's a way that people are naturally uh, obtaining DA. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, are you aware of any other ways that some of these, uh, um, I, I, I guess, opposed to a naturally uh, derived hemp concentrate like CBD, are you aware of any other ways that these sort of unnaturally hemp derived concentrates can be found in a, in a more, you know, in, a, in, in, in a different preparation? Uh, I mean, I know I've heard of, uh, you know, yeast, um, yeast conversions as well. Uh, people using yeast um, to, uh, you know, they, they've kind of bioengineered the yeast to, to run the reactions and produce the precursor molecules, oh. which then get um, further uh, formed into THC and CBD. I've heard um, this too, this bioengineering of yeast. It's, it sounds like such a great idea. I think it would create the molecule that you're looking for, right? Very <laughs> inexpensively without the grows and with just, it, you're just removing all of that hassle. And then uh, also giving you a, probably a tasteless, scentless THC. Do, is that what you're finding? Have you been able to uh, look at any of these yeasts or, or see what so they're creating? We have a few clients. I mean, again, we're limited by what we, what the, you know, what we see from our clients, right? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We have a few clients who, uh, who have have submitted samples for, uh, uh, you know, using yeast derived products. I haven't really seen, you know, final THC and CBD uh, mm -hmm. production. You know, I've seen some of the the precursors coming in, and so we test for those precursors. And oh, you're testing for them. Oh, yeah. My God. So. So that's, um, that I, I think that there's definitely uh, work being done in that area. And I think, you know, uh, again, th there may be some, some companies that are further along in the game than some of the clients that we've been testing for. Um, but at the moment, that's I don't really think it's interesting, a, you know, I, I don't think me, it's a big thing, right? Yeah. It makes me wonder how long it's going to take before they get put into products and then what kind of mm -hmm. regulation that particular, uh, 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 you know, yeast derived THC mm -hmm. molecule, what kind of regulation that's going to be going through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting new industry. So, um, so what do you see as the potential risks and, and benefits of these products? Yeah, so as I said before, I think there's there's really two things that we need to look at. One is, you know, the, the compounds themselves, you know, uh, you know, delta eight, uh, as as you mentioned, you know, maybe ha has been, you know, if it's, it's present in hashish, it maybe has been consumed for for longer uh, than just the last six months or so. But I think the yeah. rise in, in the production of delta eight and some of these other uh, converted cannabinoids. Um, is a relatively new thing. So, you know, I, I do think we need just to be careful and, and you know, 
Um, you know, ideally, a, a nice clinical study would be um, great to see, you know, the, both the efficacy, oh, yeah. approaching them thoughtfully, but I mean, getting a clinical study around, we don't even have clinical studies on THC right, you know, right. for virtually yeah. anything except for maybe multiple sclerosis and seizures. And even with seizures, we only have 500 kids that have been studied in decent randomized controlled trials. I mean, trying to get trials on these products, my goodness, I mean, stand in line, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, barring that, uh, you know, we, we need to kind of, I think, I think one of the issues is that when you get these conversions happening, you, you may, you know, have your conversion get as much as 80, 85% of Delta eight, but you know, 85% is not hundred percent. And so what's the other 15%. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of times, um, we'll see, I, I, okay, I should actually say 99% of the samples of D8 that we've gotten or that we've received when tested contain uh, some Delta 9 in it that's above the legal limit. Uh, oh, really? Virtually yeah. all of them? Virtually all of them. And, you know, I, I think that's, you know, the, the, I, there's always kind of a question of, um, and we've gotten complaints from clients, you know, when we, when we report these numbers, like, oh, this doesn't have any Delta 9 in it. That we because they want it to be federally legal, and to us the distinction right now is not that delta eight or delta nine is you know to, to me the, they're they're kind of both in the same kind of realm. You know, there's a lot more language specific to delta nine uh, in the federal space, right? But I think delta eight is kind of in that same category. Uh, federally, they're, they're considered very similar. Um, you know, the farm bill again, it 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 limits their <clears throat> the the language to delta nine but you know older you know schedule one narcotic lists uh discuss you know every isomer of tetrahydrocannabinol so earlier um, schedule one less yeah yeah so which makes you think that the people who were writing the farm bill you know must have known that there was the potential for some uh you know intoxicating uh uh um you know, unnaturally derived hept concentrates and, and didn't, think, yeah. didn't really make any, uh, any plans for it in the hemp bill. Yeah. I actually read in a, in a kind of a comment section, um, in, you know, responses to the farm bill. Um, yeah. and you know, cause yeah, the people would comment like, what about Delta eight? And right. their response was, oh, because Delta eight is so, so small, um, in, in naturally derived hemp, then, you know, and, and we're only looking for, you know, 0.3%, uh, D9, the, the level of, of D8 is going to be, you know, 0 0.0003 or whatever, um, mm -hmm. in, in the natural form. So they, they didn't even, maybe they either didn't want to say anything or <laughs> they, they didn't know about it or something. They just decided to, so, to I don't skirt. know how they couldn't have known about it. Cause I mean, there's studies all the way back to the 1970s where people talked about, uh, doing these modifications to, uh, right. cannabis to create these outcomes. So I can't believe that they weren't thinking about it or didn't comment on it when right, they pulled right. together the farm bill and just left it sort of not, uh, but they also of course really didn't put any age restraint on the product either. So maybe they just didn't really uh, sit down and think about it perhaps long enough. I, you know, I'm not sure. It is yeah. funny that, it, that it's not in there. Yeah, I'm really not sure either. And, you know, I, I really kind of wish that there was just clear, you know, uh, language from, from the federal government to kind of guide where we're, we're going with this. Because yeah. right now I feel like it, it's kind of the Wild West. And, oh. you know, uh, you know, in our opinion, we... We, we think that, again, we, we need to be careful with these products, make sure they're safe. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the ways to do that is to kind of regulate them similarly to uh, Delta 9 products and, you know, make sure that we do the extra safety testing that's involved. Um, yeah. Even with perhaps an, an added couple of safety tests to make sure there's no acids or things like that, we wouldn't normally test for in normal, you know, cannabis samples. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not even bringing these things up with my patients, and then and then my patients are coming in saying, you know, the D8 works so much better for my ADHD that I'm not going to take any more cannabis. I'm just going to be exclusively on D8. Mm -hmm. I've had patients with sleep disorder. A lot of my sleep patients come back with very positive reactions to D8, not because I told them to try but just because they got an opportunity to take it and figured they'd try it and then are, are just thrilled with it. So mm. they, 
they, there seems to be, I mean, different benefits or risks to different, to, to, to these different compounds and THCV um, being looked at, you know, for uh, weight loss and CBN uh, for, you know, for cognitive effects, for sleep or for anxiety. Um, you know, these, uh, these little chemical modifications, these additional concentrations uh, seem to be having uh, an impact on how the chemical is received in the body and how the compound is received in the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Delta, Delta uh, yeah, sorry, I should say THCV is, is a kind of an interesting one because it is present in natural cannabis, uh, but it's, it's, you know, normal form is the Delta 9 THCV. Uh, okay. But typically what you're seeing in these converted uh, samples, which, which, you know, because there's not a lot of, uh, you know, natural or THC in natural cannabis, I think mm -hmm. a lot of the THCV that you see, you know, as an isolate that you, you know, people are purchasing yeah. is converted and that, but that converted is mostly from CBD, from CBD right? It's uh, got to be an incredible right, process. Cause what are we at? Like 8,000 <coughs> a kilo for that. And it, ju it just dropped down into the mid twenties, but it's not really at any kind of reasonable range to even, you know, to even think about utilizing it, you know, mm -hmm. medicinally or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, I would say that, that, that what you normally see is about a mixture of 90% Delta eight THCV and not and about 10% Delta nine THCV. So it's not, it's not one compound or the other. Um, so I, I, I do think that maybe um, to kind of clear more clearly understand the, the effects of each one of these compounds, we need to make sure and, you know, kind of separate them a little bit better and, you know, kind of look for good manufacturing practices that are, are good at, you know, because a lot of times they'll do the conversion, mm -hmm. they'll do a distillation, let's say, and that's it. Whatever they get, they get, and that's what they sell. Uh, maybe they'll do a potency test on it and, you know, and that, that's what we'll end up seeing. And that's kind of the standard, I would say right now. Um, so when you're looking I, well, at these products, a lot of them are contaminated with, uh, with uh, higher than acceptable levels of THC of Delta nine. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then what, and then you're seeing, are you seeing a lot of contamination with solvents or with other, uh, other, uh, you know, residuals from the processing? Uh, you know, I will say with um, with Delta eight, for the most part, we the, the most of the samples we get are pretty clean uh, for solvents, at least um, uh, processing That's chemicals. They're a little bit least, harder to look. For I would hate to hear that patients are getting into those. Right. Um, but I, I will say we have definitely seen some some that do have high levels of these, you know, methylene chloride, which is a solvent that's, you know, far, far more toxic than than like those other ones I was referring to. So that's, that's concerning to us for sure. And just the fact, so I, I'm not as concerned with the, the, the products that we actually test full panel for because they, they generally are probably doing things right. You know, they're, 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 pro they're making sure and, and uh, processing their products to a point where they're mm -hmm. safe for everyone. You're not going to be paying those extra, the extra money for those extra tests if you're not you know, doing the things that will help you get, you know, uh, compliant. So some people may just be testing for the D8, but other people are exactly. testing for all of these others. We have a comment from uh, uh, Andrew Reeves in the audience. Thank you, Andrew. I love these comments. I forgot <laughs> to stop at the 15 minute mark and remind you that you're listening to the Cannabis Clinicians Lounge uh, sponsored by the NACB with uh, Dr. Eric Paulson and uh, Dr. Mary. That's me. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's see. Men, and and uh, Andrew's comment is making Delta eight. Isn't that hard? It can be done by refluxing a strong acid like HCL with CBD. That's hydrochloric acid, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the purification and cleanup of Delta eight is more challenging and requires chromatography to uh, effectively perform. You know, that's interesting right. to think about, uh, about, yeah, if you, do you want to make a comment on that? Because I also want to think about just like how, you know, when you're running tests on THC and, and you'll have the, or, or just THC containing products and you, you know, you have this big bump of THC and then you have these little bumps around it. And mm -hmm. I have wondered if that aren't some of these, some of these minor cannabinoids that are just sort of showing up. I really personally think that the minor cannabinoids may be driving the experience that you're getting with different uh, cannabis more so than the terpenes, or perhaps at least as much as the terpenes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, th that's definitely true. I will say that we, you know, again, 
the reason why we we have seen you know 99 of the samples we see have that delta 9 in there is because in order to get rid of the delta 9 you need to do the chroma chromatography like like andrew is saying mm -hmm. um and so we you know that chromatography is a lot more expensive than I was just doing say, a, that a doesn't simple sound inexpensive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean hydrochloric acid easy super cheap but yeah chromatography now we're getting into it right right so so really when I say 99 percent of the samples we won't, we only really have one client that uh, that we've seen multiple samples from that is clean they were doing chromatography we've talked to them mm -hmm. about this they have stopped making delta 8 because that's it's not cost effective to do that right oh no so so i think i think only with you know proper regulation because again this this um you know this conversion is done by a lot of people they send it to you know tests all over the or sorry labs all over the the, the country but i think now that, that certain producers have gotten smart uh or stupid i don't know, <laughs> I don't know where you go. <laughs> but <laughs> But uh, they're they're sending their samples to specific labs that they know they will get, um, you know, uh, a non-detect on a delta nine. Um, even though you know and you can see, and they'll, they'll get ninety-five percent delta eight, and you can see that in the chromatogram that it's not that way, you know. Um, but they're using certain, uh, I guess, uh, kind of rules to kind of eliminate those peaks and say, oh, that's not really Delta nine, but yeah, it was really uh, you know, if you're doing good chromat chromatography or, you know, a uh, good lab lab work, you can definitely separate these two peaks and identify them very clearly. And we, again, we see them all the time. Uh, most Delta eight samples that we get look identical. The chromatography looks identical because the yeah. conversion is pretty simple. You get to a point mm -hmm. where you get this mixture of a few different things. And, and, you know, right. uh, again, you need to purify it a little bit further. And I think, if we can regulate it to the point where you know that's that's a required part of the practice, mm -hmm. I would love to see that, and I would love to see more study done on delta eight and see you know like because uh, like like you said, I, I definitely heard from certain people that they prefer delta eight over delta nine, um, well, but I do also think that people are making delta eight to kind of skirt around um, you know certain laws against delta nine. Right. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's very disruptive. And if you're trying to, I mean, to find an intoxicating substance that isn't under a whole bunch of licensing and regulation, it, you know, is, uh, is, is obviously really unusual. And I'm sure it's, uh, it's very upsetting to the regulated cannabis industry to see this product, you know, uh, blowing up. I mean, I just went to a uh, trade show in uh, Richmond a week ago. Well, you know, you can say this about wherever you are. If you went to Champs in Atlanta, or champs out in Las Vegas, or, um, you know, the white label show that was at the Javits Center in New York last week, all of those were just loaded with D8, and mm -hmm. tons of opportunities to um, buy D8 and share mm -hmm. it with your community, whether you're doing convenience stores or whatever. So you can definitely see the differentiation between D8 and, and uh, Delta 9, uh, like THC from cannabis. Uh, what about... Uh, what about uh, the the delta nine derived from yeast, uh, or like you know the so-called synthetic delta nines? Can you see a difference with those on chromatography based on their derivation, or are those identical molecules? Yeah, so you know that that, that uh, we're glad you brought that up. That's definitely something we're seeing more is the these this converted delta nine from hemp. Uh, you know, delta eight is easier to make because it's a more stable compound. Um, than delta nine, uh, you you can kind of force that if you just took delta nine THC and threw acid into there as well, you know, like mm -hmm. naturally derived delta nine THC, you would could be converting it to delta eight. Um, so it's a very simple process, and it's because delta eight is more stable. Um, but to to convert CBD to delta nine selectively requires um, kind of more uh, specialized catalysts. And but however, you know, there's been a lot of of you know research done because I think it's you know, Delta nine sells for more than Delta eight does. So if you can do the conversion, you're, you could probably sell it for, you know, it's a, it's a much more valuable uh, conversion for you to do, right? So um, so we've definitely been seeing that. And because the, the catalysis is a bit more selective, we do see um, kind of a cleaner reaction. Uh, we typically in those products see um, some Delta eight still between, mm -hmm. I wanna say two and, 10%, um, but it's majority Delta nine. And there are a few other peaks in there. And we've actually been able to kind of develop 
uh, a couple of metrics to kind of determine whether these products uh -huh. are synthetic or, or natural. It makes uh, me wonder just, if people who are using those are getting more of like the weed light high that people are describing the beer versus vodka high, like that lighter high that you expect from the DA because of the lower potency. Yeah, I mean, but th I would say that they're not really that much lower potency, you know, uh, you know, you, you definitely see yeah. some concentrates that are really high, but these are kind of a mid range, you know, what we would you know, seeing a lot of distillates. Um, you know, we had, we actually had a big client that were, that was using this converted stuff in lieu of their, their, you know, naturally derived stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's, it, it, you know, at the moment, or I, I guess you should say, you know, before recently that a lot of this conversion hasn't been even breached in a lot of the regulatory sphere, you know, because it's, yeah. Uh, there's so much been so much focus on Delta eight. There's not been a lot of focus on Delta not converted. Well, I don't really mean that the conversion products themselves, that the bucket of Delta eight has got less Delta eight than Delta nine in it. But I think that the molecule, the way it interfaces is a bit mm -hmm. more, uh, is a, is sort of a beer versus uh, a vodka analogy that it just mm -hmm. doesn't hit the same way for most people, um, right. at least clinically, but I don't, but, you know, but, you know, that was, that's just my very limited clinical experience. And I probably, I expect that your clinical experience is probably more limited than mine, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, right. For sure. Yeah. For sure. How should, how do you think we should talk to our legislatures and our lawmakers about these, uh, about these concentrates? How do you think they should uh, fit into the regulated um, cannabis uh landscape? I mean, I, I think it'll be interesting. I think we, one thing we need to do is to kind of be transparent and, and to, to kind of, you know, separate these into groups and to, you know, label uh, naturally derived cannabinoids as natural and synthetic cannabinoids as synthetic. You know, I think what, what has been, what has happened to this point is uh, just kind of blanket. Um, and in fact, I think it's up, we're up to 19 states that have absolutely that outright banned Delta eight. Um, now, you know, that, that I think is partly because, you know, we, we just don't understand it enough and they want more information, but we don't really know what, what the, the, the goal is now, but it's certainly something that's been, um, that's been, uh, kind of looked at a lot, but, um, yeah. Well, and I'm sure you know, there's also issues with protection of the people who have spent a lot of money to get uh, cannabis licensing in place. I mean, right. and then if this comes in, it has the potential to be very disruptive to that industry. Yeah, and that's I mean, that's what I would say is especially with this converted Delta Nine. Uh, you know, it, we we believe that it actually has had a direct impact on the uh, kind of. Um, the prices of, of naturally derived D9 distillate that has been sold in California. And so I, I, it's having an impact on the legal market now oh, it most outside of a peripheral one, you know, from like, oh, I prefer Delta 8 over Delta 9. It's, it's now, yeah. it's now direct, a direct impact. And I think it's, but I mean, it's the cat's kind of out of the bag. I mean, how, you know, we, the, all of the ways of producing this product from CBD are like on the internet all over the place and that, and you can get these products, my goodness, like anywhere. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, how do you, it almost feels like CBD felt five years ago. And I just, I, I don't know how they're going to be able to legislate it back into, um, back into the genie lamp. Right. I mean, again, and again, I think, I think it, they're, they're, it's very clear for Delta nine, it's certainly a muddy kind of situation. Again, you know, we, we kind of think we have a good feel on how we can differentiate the two, uh, you know, the synthetic versus the natural. Um, but I, I think for each compound, we can kind of classify it one way or the other. And at least we're being yeah. a little bit more transparent in that case. And it also guides the, the legislation to kind of, you know, take a close look and not maybe not, not, not outright ban these compounds, but say, you know, are you using these specific good manufacturing practices to make them? Mm -hmm. And, you know, are you, are, are we doing these extra safety tests to, you know, ensure that there's no acids and there's no, um, you know, harmful solvents. No residuals. Yeah. No yeah. residuals from the production. Oh, it certainly has to be tested. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, I, I'm a huge fan for all of the testing through a reputable lab. Now <laughs> here, here comes a big 
very long winded question. So it, when in the in the development, <clears throat> just one second, let me just get ready to talk for like 30 seconds. <laughs> in the uh, in the in the uh, development of D8, you know, my understanding is that the CBD has to move into THC into a delta nine, and then converts over to delta eight. And so one concern about the legality of this process is that at some point, the person who's doing this conversion has got THC at excessively high levels. And they're, so they're in possession of THC, even though it's in the process of, of this chemical, uh, this chemical reduction. And that makes it, you know, unlawful, the, uh, the, the synthesis of D8. Um, can you talk about that? Yeah, I've, I've actually definitely seen uh, some legislation that, that states that at no point during any processing of any compound uh, or, or, or uh, ex extract can the level of THC be above a 0.3%. And that, yeah, that would actually, I mean, that would definitely <clears throat> uh, apply to this as well. I mean, we, we do get samples uh, of D8 that, you know, like people will, will uh, take, you know, fractions out of their uh, reaction before it's uh, finished converting. And we'll see mixtures of CBD and delta nine THC and delta eight THC, and they will be, really? you know, at relatively high percentages of all three of them. So, um, yeah, so definitely you, you will get you get high levels of delta nine in these in these reactions. Um, and that's that's the thing that these you know that that's what people what people are taking advantage of in the D nine conversions is they're they're choosing catalysts that will take it to D nine and then not not go further you know, not to take it further to D8. To Delta so 8. how do you feel about the synthetic D9? I mean, certainly there's a, the, an impact on the regulated cannabis industry, but who do you think is most affected by synthetic products? I mean, I feel like I feel like uh, there are so many people who are looking for a 10 milligram THC mint to just pop before they go to the gym or before they want to really focus on their housekeeping or a particular project, or they just want to really be fo focused and, and treat their symptoms and not have that odor or really any other problem with it. So I can see where, you know, a tasteless odorless yeast derived THC would, um, it would have a big dent in, in people that I really love in this industry, like the growers and the, you know, all of the people that are really tending to the plant. Um, it, how, how do you feel about these uh, synthetic D9s and how they're impacting the regulated industry? Who do you think is going to get hit the worst, if at all? I mean, I, we definitely see, or we, we've seen uh, some of our clients, so one of our biggest clients, actually, um, they've been struggling recently with, uh, you know, a, kind of an overabundance of uh, you know, uh, naturally derived uh, D9 uh, uh, distillate. And so, you know, I, th they, plus the growers that are, that are making the, the doing the cannabis growing, um, I mean, they're, they're definitely struggling as well. I think, I think it, it affects those, you know, people towards the beginning, you know, if, if you're a manufacturing, a manufacturer of vape pens and you, you know, you, you have the choice to, um, you know, either put synthetic or natural D9 in your vape pen, uh, or in your gummy or something like that, then that's, you know, that's not going to impact you very much, I feel like. In fact, you know, if you're using you... the synthetic, synthetic uh, D9 that you can maybe get more cheaply, then it's yeah. actually uh, a benefit for you. But it's, it's you know, then affecting the, the, the farmers and the, and the cultivators and the extractors of the natural stuff as well. So it's kind of a chain, chain reaction. And it's tough to kind of uh, but, you know, so again, mm -hmm. I think part of that is, can be solved by kind of applying similar regulations to hemp as we do to mm -hmm. cannabis and not to kind of classify them as two separate things anymore. Um, and, I, and I know that that federally that it's been done like that because, um, you know, because we, we, we don't want to remove Delta 9 or the, 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 the legislators don't want to remove Delta 9 THC from the um the schedule one narcotic uh right. list right um but i think as individual states at least but until you know we see federal cannabis uh movement on federal cannabis legalization we just need to kind of uh normalize the the two spheres i guess and that way you know you're you're it's not about kind of trying to trying to get the uh 
product out quickest to the most people you, you possibly can. It's about making a good product, making sure it's safe, making sure you're going through kind of the same steps that a, a normal, uh, you know, a, a naturally derived um, product will be going through. Uh, right. That's, you know, like a, like a, a, you know, Delta 9 product that we would see through the, the regulated sphere. Sure. Um, is there, um, I mean, is there any, I don't, I don't know personally the cost difference between a synthetic Delta 9 and a regular Delta 9. Is there, a, is there, a, or a cannabis derived Delta 9, is there a major cost difference between those two? Yeah. So, um, oh, and then I, I also wanted to ask you, when you are extracting the Delta 9 from, uh, from the cannabis plant. What kind of solvents do you use to do that, to get a more concentrated Delta 9 from a plant? From a, like a, a normal extraction, I would say, yeah, the, the most common solvents are ethanol and butane for that one. Um, okay. uh, ethanol will pull really all of the cannabinoids out as well as, you know, chlorophyll and, you know, waxes and fats and stuff. And so there's a, a number of processing steps that are needed to be performed to kind of get the Delta 9 THC um, separated. Um, <clears throat> but typically you do see minor amounts of small you know, THCV and, and CBN and uh, CBC, a lot of times you will see in that uh, natural Delta-9 distillate. So that, okay. and then, those, those and cannabinoids, then are, if, if you wanted those natural cannabinoids in a small, those minor cannabinoids, like you're, you're referring to, in small yeah. amounts, you will, you will get that with natural uh, extracted uh, Delta-9 THC. But trying to extract those out from uh, from a uh, from a cannabis plant would be would be really just costly. After right, the right. butane or ethanol, then what other types of distillation does it go through to further concentrate the THC? Yeah, so usually you have to remove the fats uh, through a process called winterization. So you have your ethanol mixture, you uh, you have to cool it down a lot, and the fats kind of solidify and fall down to the bottom. You filter that, um, and then usually you uh, you uh, evaporate the ethanol and then you take your kind of crude extract and then put it through a distillation. Um, the same process is done with hemp, you know, to get it to the CBD point or the, the CBD distillate, the distillate high in CBD, I should say, uh, you know, you'll, you'll probably go through those exact same steps uh, to get the CBD, but then okay. to get the, you know, the, the synthetic cannabinoids from that, it, it requires further steps, right? Now, how often are you seeing in CBD or in concentrated uh, D9 cannabis from the plant? How often are you seeing contamination there? From the, the natural? Uh, yeah, D9? just like solvents or residuals that are left over from the production process. I yeah, mean, so you said most D8 that's coming in is coming in hot, but it's coming in clean. But uh, but what about the uh, the naturally derived THC concentrates? I would say yeah, it's it's very similar. It's it's coming in largely clean. Uh, if we do see something, it's it's typically you know a little bit of ethanol or a little bit of butane or something like that um, in terms of solvents. Uh, we do see pesticides uh, occasionally, mm -hmm. and pesticides. that's yeah, and that's definitely something that um, you know we used to see a lot more of. But in this kind of regulated space, we we definitely have that those have cut down, um, and that's it something didn't I didn't occur to me that yeast THC isn't going to have any pesticides on it. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think it should, right? Is there is there a, a cost difference between like a yeast derived? Oh, I asked that and then went off on that tangent. So I wanted to go back to that. Is there? Yeah, we didn't a answer your original cost? question. Yeah, you didn't ever go back and answer that one, Eric. Yeah. But is but is there a cost difference? And also, is is there any labeling? Like, if my patients who are buying a synthetic concentrate, do they know? Yeah. So that at this point, there's no requirement in in any state that I know of. Uh, to label specifically these cannab these converted cannabinoids as converted or synthetic or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> so, so, you know, that's, that's kind of one thing I would push for in a regulated kind of market is to, or, you know, any, any regulator that wants to take on the, you know, you know addition of these converted cannabinoids to the regulatory, um, you know, kind of sphere is to label them as converted. And that's, you know, that's something that, um, you know, if you have good manufacturing practices, maybe that, that labeling can be removed in the future so that, you know, everyone knows that this is, that this compound was derived from 
some sort of conversion process, but you know, we've done enough studies on this to, uh, to, you know, kind of classify this as um, safe, you know, mm -hmm. so but 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 for, for the time being, I think it, it definitely needs that labeling. Um, the, you know, but but for, for right now, we need the, re the regulations there in the first place. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, so to answer your previous question about uh, pricing, so, how much it right, right, right now, I think what we see for uh, Delta 9 distillate naturally derived is around $2,000 uh, per kilo. Um, you know, sometimes you could probably get it for a little bit less than that. But the uh, synthetic stuff, well, uh, CBD, I should say, is about four to $600 per kilo right now. Maybe oh. you can get it for even lower than that. And I, I kind of doubt that the conversion is going to, you know, drastically increase the price there. So you're probably getting, you know, something like six, 700, maybe at the most a thousand dollars per, per kilo. So it's a huge, huge price difference. That's going to change the industry. And you're growing this on a yeast medium. Like, so you're just growing it in, I mean, can you describe the, the growth environment for a synthetic D9? Oh, for, for, from yeast? Yeah. Um, you know, so I'm not, I'm not totally familiar with the yeast, uh, kind of process. So, um, yeah, so I can't really go into that too much. Oh, okay. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. That's right. I mean, you're more on the testing rather than in the, uh, yeah, I need to learn about how that's being developed. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, we also have a, a question from, uh, another audience member, uh, that was direct to me. So I don't know if I want to, uh, say his name, but anyway, another audience member saying interested to know more about THCO. Um, I don't know a lot about THCO clinically. Uh, Eric, do you have any comments on THCO from, from, uh, the lab point of view? Uh, so I will say it's also a compound that has to go through some sort of chemical process to, to be produced. Um, you know, it's, it's the addition of, uh, an extra little group onto one of the oxygens or the free oxygen in THC, um, what we've seen so far, again, is because the the quicker way to get there, the cheaper way to get there, is through making a, some sort of delta eight, delta nine mixture, and then adding the the acetate group. Uh, you know, so THCO is is kind of short for THCO acetate. Um, that yes, yes, Andrew just clarified that. Uh, so um, so <laughs> def you. definitely, what we've seen is a mixture of del delta eight THCO acetate and delta nine THCO acetate. So, um, so it's just a further processing from T, uh, from Delta eight. And I, I kind of also wonder if the, with the increased regulation on Delta eight, people are making these derivatives to kind of say, you know, this is, um, not Delta eight to THC or Delta nine uh -huh. THC, uh -huh. something uh -huh. different. So and, that's and then, what I mean. I think it's going to be so hard to write legislation that's going to protect CBD and outlaw, you know, D eight and THCV. I just, I don't know how that legislation can be written because some of the, there's so much overlap between these different, but I, I have to tell you the whole process of all of these molecules coming in is blowing my mind. And, and it blows my mind that patients are coming to me and telling me that they're getting these results from these products. Because, you know, I mean, since the early 2000s, when Kessler was, uh, was head of the FDA, he said there, there's, it, it, you know, it reminds me as a, as a physician and having worked for 25 years in the medical industry of the way that the drug companies work, you know, you find one product that works well, like for example, estrogen, you know, helps women with hot flashes, may protect them from certain cancers, could promote other cancers, may protect them from heart disease. And then you, we, we take that estrogen and, and come up with all the different molecules around it and patent them and then start finding which one is going to do what. And some of them are better at protecting from breast cancer and other ones are more protective for osteoporosis. And, um, and then we just keep, uh, you know, presenting you with a new product that's sort of in that estrogen family, uh, after testing and proper research has been done with these with these mega funded uh, companies. And you know, Kessler way back when Dr. Kessler, he's a pediatrician, said, you know, that he wasn't going to allow any of this drug development to be happening outside of a big 
corporation like Lilly or Pfizer, that all the new drugs that were going to get approved by the FDA, we're going to go through those. So any doctor who had, you know, back when I was in residency, one of the doctors that I went to residency with was in orthopedics and he, um, you know, we went over to his house for dinner and he was making a, a new glue in the closet under the stairs. He was working on a better glue because these orthopedic uh, joint replacements fail because the glue gets unstuck. And he thought he had a glue that would allow those orthopedic, you know, um, uh, 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 fake knees and, and fake shoulders and things to be stuck in place for longer than 10 years. But, you know, nowadays you can't, as a doctor, you can't bring an idea like that forward and uh, you have to move it through the, 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 the channels that Kessler put in place in, in the early two thousands. But this feels to me like a decentralized patient centered drug development, you know, that there's all these things that people are like, try this. I heard it works on appetite. Try this. I heard it helps you sleep. And mm-hmm. just, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's, it, it's something that I've never seen before, but it has, it feels just like what you've seen all the time with the drug companies. I've just never seen it be, you know, directed by chemists out in the world, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely see that the, the benefit of that. And you know, I, you know, I, I, I kind of agree that going through big pharma all the time to get, you know, compounds on onto the street, or I shouldn't say onto the street, I'm into the, onto the shelves, into the, pharmacy. <laughs> into the pharmacy is not always the way to go. Um, and I, but I do also think that a completely unregulated system is not also the way to go. So the kind of middle ground is to kind of basically just require that all these products made by, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, responsible chemists that are, you know, doing the right practices and then going, you know, doing the proper safety testing and showing that they're doing things safely, then yeah, that's, that's totally, you know, I I could be on board board with that for sure. Well, Um, I mean, it's interesting because how do you know? I mean, we don't know we used Vioxx, right? for years. And then all of a sudden we realized it had an increased risk of heart disease and we had to pull it mm-hmm. off the market. But if you're not doing that post-market surveys and analysis, then, you know, you, you don't see trends that don't show up until you're right, serving for five years, five, million ten years people, right. or several million people for a long time. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So my real concern is that, you know, something more ominous could happen with any one of these. I mean, there's CB receptors all over your brain, but all over your entire body that are responsible to these things. And so, you know, just mm-hmm. a word of caution to everybody out there as, as exciting as all of this is, there's always that concern that a tiny modification to the molecule may, you know, serve you in an entirely negative way, you know, in the long run. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. a, it's and, additional and... study is, is, is needed with a capital mm-hmm. N. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Completely agree. Yeah. Why do you think so many uh, companies are focused on selling these novel cannabinoid products? I mean, is it uh, disruption and money? I mean, that would be how I would think that that's the reason why they've uh, have gotten to become so popular. Yeah, I mean, you, you can always you can always look at it, you know, kind of um, a, n- a number of ways. You know, you, some some uh, producers might might you know genuinely be curious and, and want to see what they can do, and um, I, I would I would probably make the guess that, you know, 90% of these producers are doing it because uh, of lower regulatory, you know, taxes yeah. are a big thing, you know, huge. I mean, it's Wait. unbelievable how much they add to your bill at the, uh, at the, uh, at the dispensary. Right. Yeah. And so that, that in and of itself is, is a big reason why I think people want to be in a market that, you know, is unregulated. Um, you know, it, it may be not necessarily for something nefarious, but, you know, they, they, they don't want to go through jump those, 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 uh, you know, those, uh, what do you call them? Rings. Uh, <laughs> but, but uh, oops, yeah, oops, sorry. <laughs> so uh, that, that, that could be one it thing. Is, it's a ton of work and a ton of expense and also just a lot of, uh, I mean, just a lot of capital, right? A lot of right. concentrated capital to get into the regulated market. Right. But, you know, that, and that, I mean, you, you have to, you have to be, you know, cognizant of the people that are going through that and are doing the proper, you know, uh, or who are jumping through those hoops and, and who are paying the taxes and trying to get, you know, product through, you know, so it's, you know, it's, you, you, you don't want to kind of um, penalize those people for doing it 
a way that, you know, probably is more sustainable and safer, you know. And so um, if there's a way that we can get, you know, these and, and maybe the maybe the hoops don't need to be as big, you know, they 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 maybe the taxes are too high. Maybe, you know, there, there's some things that can be done there, uh, but we need maybe to make it easier for make it easier, right? For people yeah. to get into a regulated industry, make it possible for somebody who's more of a small business owner to be able to have it, to have their impact in the industry they love. Mm -hmm. And I will say though, that testing is, you know, it, it is a cost, but it's not, you know, if we, if, if you look at, you know, let's say you were taking a, a, a kilo of, of um, you know, Delta eight uh, distillate that you're making and mm -hmm. you're, you're, you know, that you could fill a thousand uh, vape pens with that and sell them for $40 a pop, uh, you know, pr pr uh, presumably your revenue there would be $40,000, right? That's um, some pretty easy know, math. Obviously, yeah. <laughs> obviously there's some, uh, you know, some, uh, a little bit of uh, room there that's, that's probably, you know, there's all other costs and all that stuff, but, uh, you know, testing for a batch, you know, you're looking at four or $500 is it's, it's 1% of, of that cost, you know. So really it's not, not expensive that, at that's all. That's for a full so panel of tests. Make sure that you're mm -hmm. providing like really good quality stuff. It's only going to be four or $500 to assure that it's not contaminated. And mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. And then deal with the heat, <laughs> deal with the extra D9 that, that got created in the production, right? Right, right. So that's, I mean, yeah, that's, that's going to be a more costly thing, but I think it, you know, that's if if things are going to be regulated more similarly then you know, and, and, and maybe with federal legalization, a lot of this kind of, uh, you know, uh, distinctions that we're putting to these things about legal, not legal, that will go away. But right now, you know, a lot of things are illegal. <laughs> <laughs> and you just have so, to wonder when federal legalization is going to come. You know, I, I think that a lot of people, uh, you know, created a, a lot of things with the thought that federal legalization was sort of around the corner. And, and I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know either. And but I think it's time for states to kind of take the lead on that. Um, and, and, you know, so I will say just 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 today, California um, wrote into law that the What's that? I heard about this. Oh yeah, yeah. So, um, so they they wrote, they wrote into law that um, CBD products can be sold on on uh, shelves, but they need to be you know tested and um, go through the proper licensing and all that stuff. So, so for all CBD products, they're 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 um, uh, you know kind of enforcing and 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 really kind of taking hemp and cannabis and kind of treating it the same way. Um, you know, in Colorado, they've also kind of developed kind of in a separate, they've, they've got hemp and cannabis still separated, but they've developed a, a kind of a, a stricter set of regulations for hemp as well in, in Colorado. So we're starting to, get to see a little bit more consistency there. Um, again, with the, the conversion, uh, which we're mostly talking about today, that's, uh, you know, most states, and I think in this new bill for California, it sounds like they're effectively banning um, converted ca cannabinoids as well. So they're kind of, you know, adding to the to the the list of states, which is pretty long right now. Yeah, um, states. So, you know, I I it, I think if you know if if conversions are going to become acceptable, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's got to happen and it's got to be shown to be safe. And you know, there has to be a state that will take the lead in um, kind of wanting to jump into that. Um, it's kind of Somebody a complicated, wants to, you know, roll up their sleeves and yeah. draft some really good legislation. And that's going to be tricky because I feel like oftentimes when you're talking to legislatures, you're like down at, 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 at a elementary school level. If there is an elementary school level, mm -hmm. <laughs> or THC, it seems like they don't really understand a lot of what's going on. So finding somebody who understands it enough to write great legislation, that's going to be tough. We're going to need a good lobbyist. Right, right. Thank you so <laughs> much, Dr. Paulson, Eric, for coming on the show tonight. This show was everything that I was hoping it would be and more. It was just amazing to pick your brain about, I hate to say that word, pick your brain, but to collaborate with you on all of the great things that you're doing in, in, uh, in the laboratory field. And for everyone here, this is the Cannabis Clinicians Lounge, uh, sponsored by the NACB. If you are not an NACB member, I mean, what are you waiting for? It's just the greatest. Plus, if you're out at MJ Biz, then, you know, we can squeeze you into the after party. That's fun, too. So join, join now if you haven't joined yet. 
Oh, wait, is there a couple more chat questions? I just don't want to miss this. Oh, that's just from Ashley sort of writing everything that I said. So, uh, so I'll look out, I'll look forward to seeing you all out at MJ biz, reach out to me if you see me there at, in Vegas and, um, and Eric again, sincerely, thank you so much for, uh, for such a great podcast. Of course. Thanks for having me.